And that's called multi-loop or sometimes decentralized control. Let's say you have two inputs, U1 and y, U1 and U2, and two outputs called Y1 and Y2. You figure out how to pair the variables together. We'll talk about this. And then you design two controllers, one for each of the two pairs. Okay? This, uh, this is relatively simple and usually works. Okay? Um, it doesn't always work, though. As the plant gets really complex and there's a lot of heat um, and energy, heat and energy, heat and mass integration, there's a lot of interactions between the variables of the plant and maybe different units in the plant. This tends not to work as well. Okay? This is always where you start, or typically where you start. And you do this if this doesn't work. So in this case, this is called multivariable control. Um, so you don't do this explicit pairing of variables. Instead, use all the inputs to control all the outputs simultaneously. So there's no way for you to know how this is done, but I can tell you, pose this as a, as a optimization problem, which we don't learn anymore in this curriculum, um, a, a real-time optimization problem. Okay. And so if you go into industry, um, the dominant technology to do, well, there's two dominant technologies to do this. One is from Aspen Technology. You know those guys, right? Because they make Aspen. You start using Aspen yet? Okay. Um, that's a steep learning curve, <laughs> by the way, for Aspen is my experience. So they have a, a technology called dynamic matrix control. Like any good company, they just bought another company that developed it. Um, and so this is, the, I'd say, the standard for this kind of technology in industry. And Honeywell also has um, a package that they sell that you can use. Okay? Um, and so this type of more advanced control technology, which is a little bit beyond the scope of what we can teach here, um, is important if the process is really slow. There's a lot of interactions among the variables so that when you do this pairing, it doesn't work very well. And also, if, if the plant is kind of highly constrained, meaning you have to operate the plant in a really small envelope of operating conditions, it's really hard to tune these controllers like this to do that. You can do it much more readily here. The problem with this is this is time and labor intensive. So this is also time and labor intensive, but not nearly as much as this. Okay. So I've been involved in a couple projects where they did this at a couple of companies, and you know, you're talking a quarter million dollar project or something to do this. And you're also talking about plant testing, collecting the data to build the models, six weeks, 24 hours a day, two engineers. You know, it might take th two engineers three months to do this. So I mean, it's not something you do for fun. I, I would think it's fun, but you, you have to make sure it's going to make money, right? So we'll talk a little bit about this at the end. And you'll probably encounter this at some point if you go into at least basic chemicals and commodity chemicals. You won't see this in bio or batch or anything. But. OK, process design. So the way plants are built still is that there's um, a two-fold approach. First of all, there's a process design team, right? They come in, they, they design the plant. They design the plant using things like Aspen Plus, like you guys are using, right? They put their reactors together and their columns together, and they do some analysis. And they come out with what they consider as an economic design, right? And then they build the plant, or start to build the plant, or start having plans to build the plant. And then they call the control people in. And then they say, control the plant. OK, this is the plant. Please control it. Um, the earlier one gets the control people in, the better, as I'll mention here. But so hopefully you know, when you design, do design, when you do Aspen Plus, this is all steady state. right? That's a steady state simulator. No dynamics are included whatsoever. And the problem with this is it may produce processes that are really difficult to control. Because control has just to do with dynamics. And if your simulation of the plant doesn't include dynamics, you'll have no idea if it's controllable. Okay? When will you know? When you, when you try to operate the plant. <laughs> okay? Or operate the pilot plant. Or maybe someone will have the wherewithal. You, know, there, you guys don't learn this, but you can take your model in Aspen Plus and create a dynamic model from that. And, and it, it's a bit of work, but you can take the same model and kind of make a dynamic version. Then you could test out control, like before you build the plant, right? It's much easier to find out the design is not controllable on a computer than when you build the plant. And uh, there was a case where I think this was DuPont, they built like a $200 million plant, they could never start it up. It never ran. Okay. So this idea of you know, designing a plant and then later controlling it maybe is not ideal. And the earlier the control people get involved in, 
influencing the design, the better. Because then you can ID things that are going to be problems and try to change them before you actually build the plant. Okay. Um, so this idea is called integrated process design and control, where you consider whether the process is operable dynamically when you're doing the design. Okay. Um, this tends to be more popular research topic for academics than for industrial people. So I think industry does apply this more and more, getting control people involved earlier and earlier. Um, but it's still, still quite a bit of work to be done there. So just to give you some examples of what happens um, when you do this, you guys in um, design, are you talking about heat and mass integration? Have you talked about that at all? Okay. So, so let's say you have a column. You have these two coupled columns, right? And like this column runs at a hotter temperature than this column. So you're like, man, I'm losing a lot of energy here, right? I'm going to do some heat integration on this column. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the overhead product here. Instead of having this, I'm going to, I'm going to integrate this condenser and this reboiler together because I'm using energy to cool this and I'm using energy to heat this. Why don't I just take this stream, run it through the reboiler, right? So that'll cool this stream and it'll heat the other stream and I won't need an ex ex external source of, of heat or cooling. Right? So it seems awesome to save all that energy there and there by, by integrating these two units together in a single reboiler. Okay, so certainly from a, I'm, I can tell you from a steady state perspective, this will look really good because you'll save energy, right? And you know, some, it's some ridiculous number like 12% of the energy in the United States used for distillation. You ever heard that one? 12% of all the energy used in the United States is used to run distillation columns. So these, you know, especially if you have a massive column with massive throughput, this could be quite a bit of energy. So this might look great. But when you start looking at control, you may not like this nearly as much. Because first of all, the way the columns used to work is this column affected this column, but this column didn't affect this column. But now they affect each other in both directions, right? So if there's a perturbation in column two, that's going to affect column one. And then that might affect column two again. So you might get these two columns kind of oscillating or something now because there's feedback between the columns that's not so desirable. Um, and the second thing is we had the ability here to adjust the coolant and adjust the reboiler duty. You guys talk about reboiler duty, I hope. That's the amount of heat you put into the reboiler or condenser duty. So I used to have those two handles, right? I could use those to do control. Now they're both gone, right? I get whatever heat transfer I get here. I have no control over it. So now I have two coupled columns with less, less things I can manipulate to control the column. So this is guaranteed to be harder to control. So if it's a lot harder to control, it may not work. You know, it just depends. All right, so here's another one. So what do you have here? Well, you ha you're trying to heat up feed for a reactor because you want the feed to be hot. So you're going to put the cold feed through an exchanger. You're going to run some heating medium here. It says um, oil to heat up the feed to produce the product. But if this is an exothermic reaction, then the product is maybe, this product stream is quite hot. And maybe one should take this product stream and use that to heat up the feed. This should, be, this should ring bells. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. Trouble. Okay. Um, so yeah, take this product stream, and instead of using the oil here, use this to heat, right? And then you'll cool the product. You probably want to cool the product anyway. And then you'll heat up the feed both. Save energy of heating there and maybe cooling downstream of the product. Okay. So obviously this is going to look good from an energy perspective, but from a control perspective could be problematic. Obviously there'll be more interactions between these two. Now the reactor affects the heat exchange. In particular, it affects the temperature of the feed. So this introduces something called positive feedback. So in the world of feedback, we love negative feedback. We hate positive feedback. So as an example of positive feedback, um, okay, temperature gets hotter here. Well, so does the feed, right? Because it heats here. More heat exchange, hotter feed. Hotter still. <laughs> so you could get in a situation where this thing gets hotter and hotter and hotter. You lose control of the reactor this way. That's called positive feedback. That'll be a problem. And also, we don't have this, um, we used to have this to manipulate, right? So if you felt like the reactor was getting too, the pr temperature of the reactor was getting too hot, one approach would be you'd cut back on um, the amount of heating in this heat exchanger. Cool with feed, that'll slow the reaction. But now you don't have any control over that. Right. So again, these both look great from uh, perspective of uh, design, steady state design, maybe not for control. 
So I assume that in the design course, they don't really talk about control, right? So we'll talk about design in the control course. That's OK. All right, so this slide um, just gives you an idea about how many variables one can choose. Okay, how many independent variables are there available to do control? Okay. So the process, there's different degrees of freedom. Okay, so the so-called process degree of freedom is the number of variables you have minus the number of equations. This, this should look familiar from how you solve equations, right? Typically, you, when you solve a set of equations, you want this to be zero, right? You want the same number of variables as equations, right? So the, whoops. That should be a familiar concept to you. Um, but when we do control, you need degrees of freedom, right? If you have no degrees of freedom in your plant, that means you have nothing to manipulate. That means you can't do control. So you have to have some degrees of freedom. If everything was specified, right, then you don't have anything to manipulate. You can't do control. So you have to have some degrees of freedom. The control degrees of freedom basically is the same. Well, it's this, it's this so-called process degree of freedom. Okay, You can think of this thing being split up into things you can manipulate and things you can't manipulate. Things we can't manipulate we usually call disturbances. Okay. So if you have a two flows coming into a reactor and one of them you have no control valve, that's not available to manipulate. And so that's, that reduces the amount you can actually use for control. Okay. So the idea is that we don't typically do this analysis, but I think the main point of this slide is you have to realize there has to be some degree of freedom in the system to do control. Otherwise, you can't actuate. There's nothing to manipulate. All right, and this just says when you do control, you don't change this. So in other words, if you have an, a manipulated input and you have a controller, the manipulated input's no longer available to manipulate because the controller manipulates it, but now you manipulate the set point to the controller. <laughs> so it's just you change what you can manipulate from the input itself to the set point for the controller. So it doesn't, doesn't change the number. All right, so here's kind of a pseudo-realistic example. You have this column, and you can already see somebody has told you what measurements are available here. Okay? So everyone, I hope, knows how a column works. So I put in a feed. We'll get liquid moving down the column, vapor going up the column. We're going to take some of this liquid. We're going to put it through a reboiler, create vapor to go back up the column. We'll cover some of this as the bottom's product. We'll take the overhead. Cool it. This looks like a total condenser here. Um, store it in this drum. Take some of this off as a dislipped product. Put some of it back as reflux. Okay. So you can see that the, all the instrumentation is indicated here. So if you see a valve, that means you can manipulate the flow of that stream. If not, you can't. If you see something like this, it means you can measure something. This is composition. This is level. This is pressure. Okay. I guess that's about it. So this says we can measure the composition of the overhead and bottoms product. We can measure the inventory, the amount of material, but the level in the, in this, in the bottom of this drum, this column, and also in this overhead condenser. Um, what else? We can measure the overhead pressure. Okay? And we can manipulate the flows that you see. The duty to the reboiler, to the condenser, the reflux, and the bottoms and dislip flows. Okay. All right. So. I think I mentioned this before, but hopefully you understand why there's an inventory here and here. Because if I'm running this column, I must have vapor going up the column, right? If you don't have vapor going up the column or liquid coming down the column, this column won't work well. <laughs> All right. This guarantees I'll always have an inventory of liquid that I can vaporize to make vapor. And this ensures that I always have some liquid I can send back as reflux. So you just store these inventories. Sometimes this level might be increasing, sometimes it might be decreasing, but these shall never go dry. Okay? Because if this empties or this goes dry, then you're in real trouble. And in control, one of the major problems and real big control problems is maintaining these inventories all over the plant. You know, you've got a typical plant has more than one column, has may, maybe more than one reactor, it has exchangers, it has flash drums, it has lots of um, equipment has lots of inventories all over the plant. Maintaining his inventory is like really important. We'll talk about that. All right, so if we look at this plant, we, we can say, what can we manipulate here? Well, it's, it's shown to us already. Um, bottoms flow, dislip flow, reflux flow, coolant flow, or, or duty, however you want to think about it. Sorry, that's heating. Heating and cooling, duty or flow. Okay, That's those things there. Okay. 
it so happens, I'm not asking you to compute this or I'm just, there's, there's five degrees of freedom here. That's why we have five manipulated inputs. If there was eight degrees of freedom, we could choose eight of them, okay? What do you want to control? Well, this is kind of given to you by where the vowels are. The things you want to control are obviously things having to do with product quality. That's usually the bottoms and top composition. Something to do with the inventory. So you have to control the amount of liquid there and the amount of liquid there. That's these two levels. And usually you want to control the pressure here. Hopefully you've learned, I don't know, because when you guys do separations, everything's so ideal, right? You do maybe like McCabe Thiele and stuff like that. The pressure of a column is like really critical, right? Because hopefully you understand the VLE of this column, right, depends on the pressure. So the pressure is highest in the bottom of the column, and then there's a drop as you go up the column. And the pressure distribution in this column has a lot to do with how the separation takes place. Right? It's not just temperature, it's also pressure that matters. And so if you fix the pressure here at the top of the column, you're likely to get a good or reasonable distribution of pressures throughout the column. If you just let this pressure float and be whatever it wants, then the pressure could change a lot in this column. And that won't be good all right, for control. All right, so there's, there's kind of a realistic control problem. We have five things we want to control. We have fi five things we want to manipulate. Okay. The next step, which I don't think we do, but the next step we will talk about is, OK, how do you use these five variables to control these five outputs? And, and we'll soon see that some of these things make sense. Like if someone said, I really want to control um, let's say, the, the, the composition of the bottoms product, okay? This thing. Well, like it would make sense to manipulate this flow to do that or potentially to manipulate this, this duty here. It wouldn't make any sense to control the bottoms composition by adjusting the flow rate of the distillate, right? I mean, they're just too physically far away from each other. So we'll see how we do this pairing um, in a minute, I think. All right. So this is how we go about selecting different variables, let's say. There's a couple of slides on this. So output variables, there's two types, things that we can measure and things that we control. So in a typical plant, there's many, many, many measurements, and there's a lot fewer things you actually control. Okay? You, and they're usually subsets. You can't control things you can't measure, at least as far as we're concerned. There's two types of input variables. Manipulated variables, those are things that we can manipulate to ena enact control. And then there's disturbance variables. Those are things we have no control over. Okay. Like temperature of the day, or um, maybe flow to a column, or temperature of the feed, or whatever. In many cases, we have no control over these. Okay. So this is a basic degree of freedom argument here. If you want to control a process, the number of things you manipulate have to be at least as great as the number of things you want to control. So someone said, I had five inputs I want to control. You have to have at least five inputs. Did I say inputs twice? Sorry. If you have five outputs you want to control, you have to have at least five inputs. Right? If you want to make five variables go arbitrarily any place you want, you have to have five things to manipulate, at least. You can't make five things assume set point values that you'd like by manipulating three things. There's not enough degrees of freedom. You could use 10, right? You could have 10 inputs and, and control five outputs, but you have to have at least five to control five. Okay? So that's a, ba a basic requirement. And when I did this example here, you know, the, the way you would actually do the example probably more likely is you choose the things you want to control and then you choose what you manipulate. And this number better be at least as big as this. It could be bigger, but it can't be smaller. Okay. All right, so here's how you go about selecting outputs. So this is kind of in the order you would do it. So the first thing you say is you have to control things that are not self-regulating, things that won't control themselves. Okay. That generally means things that are either dynamics that are unstable or integrating, right? You remember when we did a dynamic response of an integrating system like a tank and you put a step change in it that just overflowed or emptied, okay? So you can't assume that in a distillation column that you, this level will be okay. It won't be okay, all right? You have to control it to make sure that the level is maintained at some value that you like. Otherwise, it'll empty or overflow. That's what I mean by self-regulating. Right, if you have a flow into a drum and a flow out of the drum and those two flows aren't balanced, that's not good. So you have to balance the flows with control yourself. Okay. Um, this has to do with, let's say, safety. Select outputs that have to be maintained within certain limits for the plant to be operating safely, like the temperature of a reactor. Okay. You have to control that because otherwise you might get outside the specifications of the equipment 
and that won't be good. So first one, you know, this is kind of safety, operability, this is safety. This one has to do with product quality. So select outputs that directly affect the quality, that represent the quality directly or, or, or are highly correlated with it. Like you might think if you're operating a distillation column, sorry, um, you know, you'd, what is the goal of the distillation column? Let's say take a binary feed and split it into something rich in the less volatile component and the more volatile component. These compositions probably matter. Right? And you know, it's common, for example, you want this to be 99.7% pure in the more volatile component. It doesn't happen by chance. <laughs> like you have to measure it and control it in order for that to be achieved typically. Okay? Um, so select um, outputs that strongly interact with each other. So, okay. Um, so you probably don't know what a steam header is. So when you produce steam, right, you have a an input to the generation unit that's called the header pressure, and the amount of steam you're going to generate has a lot to do with the inlet pressure, right? If the inlet pressure is low, you've got to apply a lot more energy to get the same amount of steam. So if there's lots of variations in the inlet pressure to this unit, that's going to change the amount of steam produced. That's probably not good, so you probably want to control that. Control the upstream pressure so you can have more reliable output from the unit, okay? And finally, Select things that have nice characteristics, okay? I said favorable steady state and dynamic characteristics. So to, that's, I mean, we're going to go through all this as we go through some examples, but this is one of the most important from the standpoint of what we're talking about focusing on in the course. So, so let's say you had a transfer function. So we all know what a transfer function is, I hope. Let's say it's first order. It looks like this. It has a time delay, and here's our u. Okay. So this is a transfer function that, that relates an input u to an output y. And I ask you, do you think this is a good pairing? Do you think you should use this input to control this output? I think that's a good idea. Well, it depends on the parameters here. Okay. So k, for example. You remember we always said k was the amount the output changes for a given change in input. If you have to change the input a tremendous amount to get any change in the output, this is not good. <laughs> it says u has very little steady state effect on y. That would be bad, right? So you want the gain to be relatively large. It means the input has a strong effect on the output. Because what I'm going to ultimately do is use this input, move it around so I can drive this thing to a set point. It better have a strong effect at steady state. Okay? So that's why I say large k, large steady state gain. You'd like the time constant to be small, right? Time constant tells you how quickly u affects y. If, if tau is small, u has a fast effect on y. That's good. Why would you take a slow effect when you can get a fast effect, right? So you'd like the effect to be fast, so you'd like small tau. And the time delay here tells you how long does it take before u has any effect on y at all. If this time delay is large, it's a problem. So you want the time delays to be small, OK? So that's where I came up with these, these ideas here. So if one has a choice, one does not always have a choice, but if you did, you'd want large k, small tau, small theta. That would be ideal to do control. Okay. All right. Um, how do you go about selecting things that you will manipulate? Well, first of all, select inputs. This is the corresponding <laughs> uh, flip side of the same issue here. Select inputs that have a large effect on the variable. Okay. What does that mean? Well, same thing I said. So delta y equals k, just rewriting this equation, delta u. Okay? If you want to be able to change y a lot at steady state, it says you need to have a big gain, and you have to be able to change the input a lot. You understand? So it doesn't do you any good to have a big gain, but you can only change u a tiny bit. Why? Because maybe the operations people tell you u shall not be changed much. Okay, so you, you need this product to be large. That'll be helped if k is large, and also the range that you can change the u is large as well. Okay, this might be control determined by how big the valve is that controls the flow, whatever. All right. Okay, same thing here. This is just the reverse of this same argument. How, select inputs that have a big, a rapid effect on the input. Same thing. Pick Pick inputs that affect the output of interest with small time delays and small time constants. Same thing. Okay. 
select inputs that have a direct rather than an indirect effect on the output. Okay. So I gave you this example like this. So if you wanted to control um, the overhead composition of a column, and you had two choices, condenser duty or reboiler duty, you would choose condenser because condenser is in the overhead circuit of the column, same place the composition is to be controlled, physically close. If you manipulate the reboiler duty, it has to propagate all the way up the column and then get the overhead circuit. It's very indirect. It won't work well. Okay? So pick things that are like physically close. And avoid selecting inputs that recycle disturbances. So, so this is an example. So I, I think we'll talk about this at the very end of class, but hopefully you know that when you do a reaction, you usually get incomplete conversion of the reactants. Okay? Then you send the product, what comes out of the reactor to a column. The goal of the column is to collect the product of interest. It's also to collect the unreacted reactants. And usually you recycle those back to increase yields to make more money. Okay. But um, that, so if you have a disturbance that comes out of the reactor, it'll propagate to the column, it'll propagate to the recycle stream you put back in the reactor, and this will tend to amp potentially amplify, right? Because you've created feedback in the process. So, you know, from a control perspective, you'd rather not do this. From an economic perspective, you often have to be soft to be aware of what you're doing. Okay, selection of things you want to measure. Okay. First of all, select measurements that are, <laughs> this is kind of not rocket science, right? You wouldn't select measurements that are unreliable and inaccurate, but um, select things that are reliable and accurate. That's why, I don't know if you guys do this on the column, but I think you do, but I don't know if you know you're doing it. When you run the distillation column, you guys will do control, but you're probably not doing it yet. But in any case, what you'll do when you do control is you'll control a tray temperature, not the composition coming out of the column. Okay? Why do you want to control tray temperature? Well, first of all, do you know if a, if a column is, if you have a binary mixture, then you can infer composition directly from temperature. It's only true if it's binary, though. Okay? The point of temperature is it's a much more robust measurement, right? You can get it really quickly, it's really reliable, and it's really accurate. That's to be contrasted with a GC, right? If you want to get a composition, you've got to take a sample to the GC. You get it infrequently. It's usually not very accurate. So you'd rather use temperatures and compositions if you can. Okay. Select outputs that have high sensitivity to the measured variables. So tell me if you've ever seen this. Here's a distillation column. Here's the position in the column, Z call it. Okay. So this is the bottom of the column, and this is the top of the column. Okay. And let's say this is the temperature on each tray. Okay. Hopefully the temperature is hotter in the bottom, because right, you're adding heat to a reboiler. So it's very common that these things look kind of like this. Okay. That's the temperature profile in the column. It's, the temperature doesn't change much near the top or the bottom of the column. Okay. If the, you could argue if this is really flat for a long time, the column is too big. If it's not flat at all, it's too small. Okay? But it typically will look like that. So if someone said, I'd like to control the temperature. Okay? So let's say, for example, you change the reboiler duty. And then you, get some, you increase the reboiler duty, and so what, everything will get hotter in principle. So it looks kind of like this. Okay? Those are two reboiler duties. You can see at the top and the bottom, there's no sensitivity to the reboiler duty at all. Like temperature here is almost not affected, and temperature here, but the temperatures in the middle are. So these temperatures are sensitive to the reboiler duty. These aren't, right? So if you try to control the, the bottom's temperature with reboiler duty, it's not going to work, because the reboiler duty doesn't have any effect on it. <laughs> okay? So this is what I mean by choose things that are sensitive. And we took separations. Um, it would have been nice if you guys used Aspen in there and you, could, you should have generated these kind of, these are not, you can't really generate these easily by hand. I guess you could, but anyway, it is what it is. All right, so that's what this one means. If you're going to, for example, control a tray temperature in a distillation column, one better control a tray temperature that's affected um, by operation of the column. Um, obviously, select measurements that have small time constants and small delays. Okay which means it's better to use, um, well, this doesn't give an alternative, but obviously if you measure product composition, 
that's going to tend to be slow and it's going to be infrequent and it's going to have a time delay because you have to take the sample to the GC and it usually takes about five minutes to sample. So when you get a measurement, that might be what the composition was 10 minutes ago. And you only get it every five minutes. So it's not very frequent. It's, um, it's got a time delay and it's often not very accurate. So it's not <laughs> less than ideal. Okay. So that's why you see in compositions, people only measure compositions when, they're, when they think they're critical. Okay. You'll see flow, temperature, pressure everywhere. People just put flow meters on stuff because they just do it. Okay. Um, same thing with temperature, but you just don't throw composition measurements everywhere. Right? It's just too expensive and it's too much to manage and maintain. We're doing really well. Huh. We will catch up eventually, like soon. All right, so here's another little example of an evaporator. So what we're going to do is march through this example and then we'll stop about how you do the control for this. Okay. So what are we doing here? Well, we got a stream here, and so it looks like we're trying to, this is like a flash, kind of like a flash drum, okay? So we have a volatile solvent, and we're trying to get the solvent out of this mixture and then the product here, we're trying to move solvent from a product stream, basically, okay? So what are we gonna do? We're gonna take this stream, flash it in a drum, where we apply heat, right, to heat up the fluid, the liquid, and we're assuming here that solvent is accumulated in the top because it's more volatile, and according to this picture here, the composition is that of the least volatile component, means the product. None of that goes in the overhead stream. It's not at all volatile. It's really big molecule, okay, very heavy. It all comes out the bottom. And so this is the flow rate. Let, let's just say this is mass flow rate. This is mole fraction. This is temperature of the feed stream. This is of the overhead stream called distillate here. This is the bottom stream, okay. Again, we have an inventory of liquid here. We have some pressure in the, in the vapor space here, some temperature, some density, whatever. Um, all right, so if one asks, what would you like to control in this plant, right? So someone just gives you this picture. You have no idea what to do. So the first thing you, you say is, man, I better control the inventory of liquid. Because I was told, if I go back to the previous slide, the most important things to control are th so things that are not self-regulating, right? If you don't control the level here, and then you apply enough steam here to boil off vapor faster than you, boil off liquid faster than you feed it, eventually this drum will go dry. And that won't be good, okay? So one, I better control the liquid level. I better control XB because that's the, pr I mean, you can tell from the goal, the, the picture of this process, the goal is to control that composition, right? It's to get solvent out of this. So if this comes in, let's say 20% solvent here, so this is 80%, you might want 99% pure. That's the whole goal of the process, to get the solvent and get this sufficiently pure. So it's a very good chance you want to control that, okay? And I probably should also control the pressure because this is just like a column, right? If I don't control the pressure and let this pressure just wander around, the VLE here is going to be very unpredictable. It's, it's not going to operate well, okay? So this is um, not self-regulating. This is product quality directly, and this is things that indirectly affect product quality. Okay. What things can I measure, okay? So you would assume, well, I can measure that liquid level since I'm so interested in controlling this composition here in the product stream, I better be able to measure it. I should be able to measure the overhead pressure, uh, the pressure in the vapor space here, and then the flow of the bottom.